Would you open your Bibles to John chapter 4, verse 23? It says, True worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is looking for worshippers. God isn't looking for worship. God is looking for worshippers. There's a big difference. Worship is the product of worship is. But God is looking for worship is. And he's not only looking for worship is, but he's quite specific about the nature of what these worshipers need to be. They need to be people who worship him in spirit and in truth. God is calling us to be a people who are known as worshipers. Worshipers. There's an inherent value in being a worshiper. Not only for the recipient of our worship, but actually there is something that takes place in worship that affects and changes who we are as individuals and never leaves us the same. Part of the reason that we have such a a focus and we recognize the inherent value of worship and praise in this church is because it creates a safe and intimate place for us to meet with God. And when you meet with God in that space, God can touch your life and God can do things in your life that nobody else can do. God can touch and do things in your life that no other sermon is gonna do. The reason that we create an opportunity for that space is because we want more and more people to come to a place where they recognize it, where they, when they meet God in that space of intimacy, there is a transformation that takes place in their lives. Each of us were called to the construction industry, not the travel business. We were, cons- we were called to construct something. We were called to build something. You were called to build a life. God gave you the prerogative of choosing how it is that you would want to live your life. He's given you freedom of choice, but with freedom of choice comes the responsibility to have to build something. You see, when you don't have choice, then you're in a position where you're at the dictates of whatever is given to you. But when you have choice, you can elect which way you want to go. You can elect what you want to make a part of your life and what you don't. You can elect the direction that your life takes. God has given you freedom of choice to elect how you want to live. But with that freedom comes the responsibility to create. But we have a lot of Christians who haven't really embraced the whole concept of construction because we feel so much more comfortable in the area of being travel people. You know what travelers are? Travel people are people who flit in and they come in and they have fun and they enjoy this and they enjoy that and they enjoy the relationship and they get all the benefits. But the moment something's required of them, the moment they put in a position where they have to stretch a little bit, the moment puts them, God puts them in a place where he starts to put a finger on them, all of a sudden my time is up and I'm off again and I'm on my way. And I move off to a new place. And I get into a new profession and I get into a new job and I have new relationships and I'm always flitting off and changing because that time's come to an end but I, because I'm part of the travel industry I'm on my way again. The problem with it is people who spend their lives in the travel industry never create anything. And the problem with people in the travel industry is that you end up 50 years down the road and you have a look at your life and you sit and say, where am I? I'm no better off today than I was 50 years ago. And there's nothing worse than being in that position than when you're in an environment with people who have embraced change because it becomes a foil for your life and it makes us uncomfortable. God never gives up on us. There's never, there, there is never a time where it's too late to sit and say, I want to embrace change and I want to do something. Don't waste time. Don't waste time being a travel bug. God's called us to be people who construct something. He's called us to create our lives.
When you're gonna create something, it's gonna require something of you. Nothing in creation kind of comes about for no reason at all. It's gonna require focus on your part, commitment, dedication, it's gonna require sacrifice. If you wanna have a look at anything that's ever been accomplished, go and talk to the people who were part of that and they'll tell you the, the true story to it. They'll tell you the history of what it took to get there. You want to talk to people who great, have great accomplishments in business. Go and speak to them. Let them tell you about the hard knocks and all the stuff that they had to go through in order to get to that place. Go and speak to great sportsmen, great athletes. There's a price to be paid. There is dedication. There's there is something that goes into it in order to make it. It doesn't just happen. Sometimes we live in a society where people just want to rock up and they want to get the graduation for certificate for arriving for recess. <laughs> you don't get your graduation certificate for arriving for recess. It's all the work that you put into it. It's getting into that space where you sit and say, I hate arithmetic, but you know what? I've got to spend the night trying to understand this stuff. Statistics is even worse. <laughs> Who likes statistics? And yet I had to grapple with it and do extra lessons and do all the stuff to try and get to a place that I was able to understand it and make it a part of my life. Because when I got to that place where I was qualified, what they said to me is, well done. The things that were necessary for you to get to this place so that you were qualified are in place. And you move on. We need to be qualified for things in life. It's the same thing with God. God is wanting to do something in our lives incredible. But God's sitting saying to us, what is it that you want to do? What life are you building in me? We just think it's going to happen because God is so good and God is so gracious and God is so merciful and God's just going to do all. God's not going to just do everything. God has done everything. What he's saying is, I'm shifting the responsibility to you. What I'm saying to you is, how much of it do you want? I don't want you to act like a good person. I don't want you to go and do things that you think are going to impress me. What impresses me is what you're prepared to sacrifice for me. Are you prepared to put aside your time for me, your dedication, your commitment? What kind of investment are you prepared to make for a future in me? Because it does cost you. We're creating a life. We are creating a life. What he says to us in Matthew 7, he speaks about the fact that our life should be established on a foundation. What house are you building? The foundation that he's talking about is truth. What he's saying is, I want you to come to a space where you recognize that the truth and the foundation, that the foundation of your life needs to be truth. Because when it's established on truth, it's going to leave you uncomfortable at times because it's going to expose you. The reason that he's going to expose you is not to make you feel uncomfortable. Because he recognizes that if you continue down the road of living a lie, you're living a delusion. And at some point, you're going to hit the wall. And what he's saying is, wake up a little bit here. Here is a better way to live. Here's a better way to engage life, to engage me, to engage relationships. Truth changes us. But if we don't have truth as a foundation, it doesn't matter what you build on there. At some point, it's going to be wobbly. And when it's wobbly, it collapses. And when it all falls down, lots of people say, how could you do this, God? I can't believe it. And he's saying, check the foundation. We're building something. But we have to be people who are honest enough to be able to look at ourselves and look at what it is that we're building our lives on. Because truth is the foundation, but the expression of truth is going to come through who you are as a person. And that becomes the structure that's built on that. Why is it that we want to grow? Why is it that we need to grow? Because we don't want to be the same that we've always been. The issues that you have in life and the problems that you have in life, the challenges that you have in life are not going away by themselves. How do you plan on changing them? The reason that we change as individuals is because it ushers us in and invites us to a space where we're able to perceive life differently. Our perception of the challenges and the issues in front of us and the capabilities that we have to be able to deal with those change. The whole point of change is that I move to a better place. 
Nobody's changing and going through all that is involved with change for something worse off. We're moving to a better place. God is taking us somewhere. One of the biggest challenges is when God called Israel out of Egypt and he was taking them to his promises and what it is that he had in store for them. He took them through the wilderness because the whole point of the wilderness was for them to come to a space where they recognized and they valued and they appreciated him as number one in their life. They saw him as the provider, as everything that they needed, that he would be the one to sustain them, to protect them, to take care of them. What he was looking for was he was looking for them to value and have a sense of worth on him, for him, and what, was he, what he was all about. And as a result of that, what happens is that our life begins to shift and adjust. And what ends up happening is we position ourselves at a place where we're able to embrace the promises that God has available to us. The challenge that we have in the church is that people don't want to go through the wilderness. We don't think that we need to make any adaptations or adjustments. We just want the blessings. We want the inheritance. The problem with an inheritance is that you always want to take an inheritance and give it to somebody that you believe is going to be able to embrace the inheritance and make something of it, not squander it. The challenge that we have in much of the body of, the Christ, of the body of Christ is that we're sitting and we're waiting for God to do stuff for us and he's sitting saying, can I really trust you with this stuff? Because if it was my better judgment, I think it's going to put you in a worse place than where you are right now. Oh God, I can handle it. Really? God, I thank you for my financial blessing. I want to thank you, Father, that I'm prosperous in every way and God says, okay, Fine. Let your business take off and let just you put you in a place where all of a sudden you're experiencing abundant financial blessing. What happens? Where are your priorities? I love you very much, God, but you know the special beach house that was on sale, <laughs> I know it was, it was your provision that provided it for me and that lovely sailboat that goes with it. Thank you, Lord, for that. And Father, I just want to tell you that as we drive down to the beach every weekend, we'll just thank you for this home. <laughs> And we'll thank you on the way home on Sunday evening as well. We want the blessing of God, but do we have the capacity to be able to take it and handle it responsibly? Sometimes God's blessings is more detrimental to us. Not because his blessing's the problem, but we've never grown in our capacity to handle the things that he wants for us. gift of healing. Catherine Coleman and me, two peas out of the same pod. <laughs> Tell you, I can feel it coming on. An anointing, a ministry of healing. It's going to go global. <laughs> and if he gave you that, what would happen? How many times do I become more important than the gift? And the next thing we see you on Christian television selling these special little cloths that I've prayed over. <laughs> Two for the price of one. Why? Because the character wasn't there to be able to host it. God wants to do great things in our lives, but the reason that we go through process is because he's taking us to a place where we don't lose the value set that he's wanting to establish in our lives. The litmus test. Maturity. Maturity is the indicator to which we are prepared to embrace growth. Maturity means I'm not going to be in the same place next month than I am right now. I'm not dealing with the same things the same way when I, where I am right now. Where I was yesterday was about yesterday. Today is about understanding and tomorrow is about change. Where am I moving to? What's happening in my relationship with God? How is it changing? How is it becoming more robust? How is it maturing? Maturing in Christ has nothing to do with what you know. It has everything to do with what you do. Because you know what the litmus test of maturity is. 
Trials and tribulation. <gasps> that word should never be spoken in a word and faith church. <laughs> Terrible words. It's going to happen to you. Trials and tribulation. You think that you're so spiritually mature until you run into that bad driver on 66 and see what comes out of your mouth. Watch where those fingers go. Why? We think of trials and tribulation as hellfire and brimstone. Trials and tribulations is something that says, you know what, you think you're so spiritual. Let's check this out. Let's put 92-year-old 90, granny right in front of you on 66, <laughs> who's catching a speed wobble at 18 miles an hour. Let's see how you handle it. And you know what happens? The way you respond is speaking to you. The challenges of life are showing you something. You think you're so spiritual. You think you've got patience down pat. Really? Interesting spaces. What's the point? The point is that we're always growing in life. The point is this. God created us as human beings for growth. Growth is important and growth is going to take place in our lives. Do you know that you were built for growth? You were built for growth. That's how you created. It's part of your nature. It's who you are fundamentally as a person. We are people who are imaging people. We represent and we reflect what we value. We image and we reflect what we value. Let me give you an example. Social influence. The time of our life where social influence is most pronounced is when we're in our late teens and our 20s. Social influence is a big consideration. What do people think about me? And the importance of being accepted is highly valued. It has great worth to many people in that age bracket. And because I value it, and because it has worth, when I find myself in an environment like that, what ends up happening is, me and my peers are mixing together, we're spending time together, and before terribly long, what ends up happening is I start wearing the same type of clothing that they're wearing. There is wardrobe influence. And your parents say, what are you doing wearing socks and sandals? Nobody wears socks and sandals. And they go, oh, look, it's so trendy. It's the latest fashion. You just don't get it. You're not a fashionista. And the more time they spend with their peers, before you know it, they start speaking certain ways. The languaging is influenced because everything's so cool <laughs> or non-cool or fashionable or ugh. <laughs> and you're driving in the car and your kids say to you, what is that dreadful stuff? It's the hits of the 80s. Ooh, it's awful. <laughs> it's so old-fashioned. They say, let's rather play this. And you go, you call that music. And you suddenly realize you sound like your parents, but you don't tell them. <laughs> What's the point? The point is, because we value and we uh, uh, ascribe worth to that, and we put ourselves in that environment, what ends up happening is the environment itself has an influence on who I am, and it translates into the way that I live the way that I see life, the way that my wardrobe is affected, the way I present myself, the way that I speak, what I listen to. It's not even necessarily a case that you sit down at the end of the day and say, fine, you know what? Now I'm going to be hip and cool, so let me make a list of five things I'm going to do. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's subtle. But you know what? The more time you spend in that, that, that space of intimacy, the more time you spend in that environment where you're influenced by your peers, you become like them. 
What's the point? The point is God created us as human beings to change. He created us as human beings to grow. And we grow in an environment that is defined by what we ascribe worth and value to. The reason God created it that way was because he always saw us as in the Garden of Eden. And he always thought that we would be the focus of his attention. And what he was doing was he was sitting saying, when you spend time with me and you get to know me, when you spend time in the truth of who I am and we're intimate like that, what's going to end up happening is something's going to take place in your life. You're going to start to change. Your wardrobe is going to start to change. Your languaging is going to start to change. Your thought processes are going to start to change. Your language, everything, the things about you are going to start to change. Why? Not necessarily because you sat down one day and said, you know what, I need to make sure that I say amen at least four times a day. And actually, <laughs> why? Because it came out of relationship. Because there is something innately within us as human beings that what we do is when we're in an environment that we find worthy or we value, we begin to take on that imaging. What is worship? Worship is a heartfelt reverence, appreciation, love, response to an object that we find of value or worth. There is an emotive component to what it is. God draws us into a place of worship where what he's looking for is he's looking for us to come together with him. And he's coming, he's looking for us to meet with him. Not because of what we can get, but because of what we can give. We're coming into that environment because we sit and say, I recognize worth and value. Do you know what? My life would never be where it is today if it wasn't for you. I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to step into fullness of life. I thank you for healing that's been provided for me. I thank you for deliverance. I thank you for prosperity. I thank you that you're the beginning and the end. I thank you that no matter what, I'm recognizing him. And what am I doing? I'm giving him praise and worship for who he is. And I do it out of sincerity with no ulterior motives. But the amazing thing is because he's such a good God, and because he's a giving God, when you put yourself in that space, he says, you know what? You're not going to leave here empty handed. So he starts to do something in you. And when he starts to do something in you, you suddenly find when you walk into environments, you don't feel the way you used to. You kindly stop and ask the granny on the side of the road, would you like for me to offer you a turbo alternative? <laughs> Maybe what I could do is, you know what, I'll just come and pick you up. How about that? I'll drive you to where you want. What's the point? The point is, he starts to do something in our life that changes who we are, that changes the way we see things. It's not an overt and decisive action on our part that sits and says, fine, now I'm going to be a person who's patient. Because you're going to try that for all of five minutes and realize how hard it is to do. <laughs> there is a transformation that takes place in us when we step into the most intimate space of worship. Did you know We worship what we, where we perceive value and worth. But there is a reciprocal nature to worship. In looking and deciding where we define value and worth, what we're really doing is 
there is a side to who we are that says, will I find value and worth out of that? You see, when we come into a relationship with God and we allow him to touch our lives, it should be so foundational and so core to who we are and we recognize him for who he is. And in that, he affirms our identity and gives us a sense of being. He tells us how much he loves us because he created us just the way that we were. And he says, do you know what? You have so much worth to me that I would even send my son to die just for you. He affirms us in that. But there are times where what we seek to worship is misguided. There are times where people have a look and what they decide to worship is power or position, popularity, fame. I don't know what it is. They're different things. Why? Because there is a side to them that says, if I can achieve in that area, what it'll do is it'll give me my sense of worth and it'll give me the sense of value. It's misguided worship. Because you see, when you worship something, what you do is you extol it and you give it an elevated position and you give it influence in your life. And when you give it influence in your life, what you do is you allow it the opportunity to change aspects of your life. And so when your worship is misguided, it takes you to a place of ruin as opposed to a place of restoration. We have a political environment at the moment where, position, where, where um, power is more important than principle. When power is more important, you know what ends up happening? I'll compromise on this principle a little bit because you know what? It'll give me what I'm looking for. Who needs integrity? Not so important. You know what? I'll give me power. The point that I'm making is this. What we worship has influence over our lives and it begins to change and transform who we are as people. And when we are misguided, the things that really should be given the attention to move closer to resembling the nature of God and what he's all about are not. And so what ends up happening is we don't become a person that's reflective of him and who he is. We become reflective of whatever it is we're worshiping. If you want to know what your future looks like, use your future as a, tra as a trajectory. What you worshiping is going to give you an idea of what your life is going to look like. If you're in a space where you're worshiping God, and that's your commitment and that's your devotion, it'll take you to a place of depth and new dimensions in Him. It'll make you and affect your nature so that you're more reflective of who He is. If you are worshipping something else, you will go down that road and it will affect you and influence you that way. What we worship, we allow to influence our lives and ultimately define us. What you worship is going to give you definition. And when you walk into a space, people are going to look at you and they're going to say, what? What? He's the personification of what? You, should be, you will be the personification of what you worship. God's called us into a space of worship. He's called us to a place where he says, I'm looking for worshipers. I'm looking for people who will come and who will worship me in spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. Spirit because the place that's most important in your life is that place where he resides. That's your spirit. That's a point of connection. That's where he communicates and that's where he communes with you. But it's also about truth. Why is it about truth? Because he reveals truth to us. But when he reveals truth to us, what he's asking us to do is come into a space where we recognize him through that truth 
and we celebrate and praise and worship him in that space. Why is truth important? Because we become like what we worship. If you have some warped idea about God and you go in with that and you start celebrating that, you will become like that because that is the way you're viewing things. It needs God to bring truth into the situation. When he delivers truth into your life and into your situation and you worship him out of truth and you genuinely thank him for that truth and that understanding and you praise him and worship him because he's so wonderful in that, what ends up happening is God uses that as a way to begin to influence your life and change you and who you are and you become more like that. Worship is a core pillar of this church. Not because we like songs or singers or instruments, but because we celebrate worshipers. Because we understand that it is an environment that opens the door for you to change your life more than most other things can. Worship brings with it a requirement of sacrifice. I don't like that song. So I'm going to stand here. You're not affecting anybody but yourself. I don't like, it's too loud. It's too loud. I have to find a softer place. The ear, not earbuds. What are they called? Earplugs. Not buds. You can take care of your own earbuds at home. The earplugs at the back. Well, I don't, you know, I just think it's way too emotional for me. Be what you want to be. Nobody told you to be somebody else. Be you. Close your eyes, you'll be amazed. You won't see a single thing. <laughs> All the emotion will disappear in the fraction of a second. What's the point? The point is, it's more important for you to worship and put, you in a, and put yourself in a space where you worship than to give a thousand excuses why you don't. Do it the way you want to. It's about you and God. It's not about anybody else. It's not even about the musicians. What you're doing is you're recognizing the potential and the power of worship to influence my life. And what you're saying to God is, you know what? It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter what I think about the worship. It doesn't matter what I think about guitars. It doesn't matter what I think about Laurie's voice. It doesn't matter what I think about. You know what the most important thing is right now? I want to get to that space where it's intimate between you and me. Because I want to get to that place where I celebrate you for who you are. And Father, I just want to thank you. That's the full extent of it. And you know what? When you do that, you will leave here changed. Because he'll never leave you empty-handed.